beautiful today. I'm on the quayside, so it's a lovely view. I'm sorry you can't see it, but it is it is lovely. Um, so today's session is going to be focused on attracting and retaining a diverse and inclusive workforce. And I think you'll agree with lots of unfilled vacancies and struggles to retain talent. HR is having to think a little bit more outside of the box in its approach to recruitment, talent, upskilling and retention strategies and policies. But what if we looked at this problem a little bit differently? What if we could be more inclusive and look towards workers from a more diverse group of people? So today we're hoping to spark some ideas in which you and your organisation could recruit and retain in a more inclusive and diverse way and talk about some of the northern organisations who've already started on that journey. Um, so for those of you who don't know me already, um, I'm Kayleigh Tobel, I'm an engagement manager on the CIPD and Northern England team. I'll be chairing today's session. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information, the CIPD Northern Policy Forum has the purpose of giving our region's members, HR professionals and customers with a platform to use their voice to help us to influence government on the future world of work and to fulfil our purpose of championing better work and working lives. So your views and insights help us to respond to work related government consultations and recommend changes to policy, as well as to create best practice guidance for employers and policy makers. So we'll continue to run sessions throughout the year as we have been doing and we'll share our quarterly forum update to keep you in the loop with those who are members. If you're not currently a member of the forum and you'd like to join, um, one of the team can pop a link in the chat for you uh, to sign up if you'd like to receive that and be involved in our activities going forwards. So just a little bit uh, before we get started on housekeeping and agenda, if you could please keep your microphones on mute unless you're asking a question, that would be fantastic. And we've allocated some dedicated Q&A time within today's session. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can either put it in the chat as we go or you can pop your virtual hand up during that part of the session and we'll come to you in order. Uh, please use the chat function to network, share comments, ask questions. Um, it's your session just as much as is ours. So please use that, utilise that. And the team will be on hand to monitor that throughout the session. Uh, we are recording today's uh, session two to share with members externally who couldn't make it. So if you don't wish to be seen, if you could please turn your camera off. Uh, we may also take a couple of screenshots. Uh, so the same goes for that if you'd not like your screenshot to be taken. Um, so today's agenda. Uh, so we've got James Cockett, who's going to be talking us through our latest labour market outlook and Northern Insights. We're then going to go to Sally, who's going to tell us a little bit about G uh, the CIPD Trust. We're going to put Sally in the hot seat a little bit and find out a little bit more. And then we're going to go to Jake, who's going to talk us through some of CIPD's research um, in inclusive recruitment and hiring and the research that we've got in that area. And then we'll go to Q&A. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to James, who is a labour market economist here at CIPD, and he's going to talk us through the latest insights from our labour market outlook, which was only published last week. Uh, so fresh off the press, guys. Um, so I'll just hand over to you now, James. Thank you. Brilliant. Just started sharing. Hopefully you can all see that now. I've got thumbs up. Yep, thumbs up. Brilliant. Yep. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you and hello and thank you for joining this uh, Northern Policy Forum. Uh, yeah, my name is James and today I'm going to unveil some insights about underrepresented groups in Northern England. Uh, why? Well, because employers like you are suffering with uh, skills and labour market shortages, labour shortages, which can be overcome by attracting and retaining a diverse workforce. Uh, so firstly, let's put these shortages into context. So as Kaylee says, the first set of charts come from the Labour Market Outlook, which was published last Monday. Um, the quarterly CIPD Labour Market Outlook uh, provides an early indication of future changes to the labour market, mainly around uh, recruitment, redundancy uh, and pay intentions, based on a survey of around 2,000 employers. So the key employment barometer we use in the LMO is the net employment balance, which basically measures the difference between employers expecting to increase uh, staff levels in the next three months and the difference between those uh, expecting to decrease staff levels. Basically, anything above zero means more employers are looking to expand their workforce. So overall, this has remained stable at 27 this quarter, and this is above pre-pandemic levels. So this slide breaks this down by industry. So it's interesting to see the industry at the top, such as construction, hospitality and healthcare, 
However, the key take home here should be that across all industries, there are more employers uh, who are looking to increase staff levels than decrease staff levels. So this chart shows the percentage of employers planning to recruit in the next month, three months, sorry. The latest data shows that 80%, 84% of employers in the public sector plan to do so, and that's indicated by the grey line. Uh, the majority of firms in both the private and voluntary sector also plan to recruit within the next three months. So why are these figures so high? Well, this is because many employers are currently having difficulties in recruitment. So around four in 10 employers have hard to fill vacancies, as indicated by the dark purple bar in figure six. Figure eight below this shows that a quarter of employers expect significant problems in filling hard to fill vacancies in the next six months. So they're kind of not expecting this to go away anytime soon. This is overall, but what, where, where is this felt the strongest? So the leading finding from this quarter's data showed that hard to fill vacancies are more apparent in the public sector, particularly in education and healthcare, where over half of employers have hard to fill vacancies, again denoted by the dark purple bars. The key message here is that many employers, regardless of, in, of industry, are likely to have hard to fill roles. Uh, hard to fill roles. Um, we focus on in Somebody said they muted me. Uh, we focus on industry analysis in the LMO. Um, as we believe this is quite informative, you're more likely to be more similar to firms in the same industry than, than other firms kind of in the region, but in operating in different contexts. Um, I did run the uh, regional cuts of data for this, and there's no differences in the level of hard to fill vacancies by region across the UK. So coming to vacancies, the total number of vacancies in the UK remains above 1 million, and this is high as employ employers settle into this post-COVID post world. However, we are able to untangle that vacancies in northern regions remain highest compared to pre-pandemic levels, as, predicted, as depicted by the red, orange and yellow lines. So while many employers are having problems in filling vacancies, many are not being proactive in hiring underrepresented groups or groups who face barriers entering or, late, or remaining in the labour force. So the LMO finds that only 10% of employers with hard to fill vacancies have targeted underutilised groups in the last six months and the same level plan to do so in future. And this is something the employers UK wide can improve on. Other groups such as older workers, parents returners and ex-welfare claimants are more explicitly included as options within the LMA. So approximately one in five employers have or plan to make a greater effort to recruit older workers or to hire parent returners, but very few plan to hire more expert welfare claimants. So the issues that employers are currently experiencing should be seen as an opportunity to diversify in hiring processes. In the following slides, I'll review some charts taking a deep dive into regional differences, which will hopefully ignite change, enabling you to understand the opportunity you have to transform your workforce by hiring of different groups. So in the Northwest, more than one in 10 working age people are out of work but wish to work, and this is the highest rate in the entire country. However, fewer than half of these people are unemployed, i.e. defined as actively looking for work. The level of people out of work, but wanting to work is also high in the Northwest and Yorkshire and the Humber. There are a variety of reasons for this. People take retirement. Indeed, many took early retirement over COVID, but there are still a small percentage of those who still wish to work. People are students, full-time or part-time, who tend to be younger, but some may wish to work while, subjects, while studying. A sizable and growing level of people wish to work, but are unable to due to being sick or disabled, and longer than ever NHS wait times are contributing to this. There are also people who want to work, but are caring for children or relatives. Levels some can sometimes keep seem quite abstract, so let's put some numbers to this. So 
Due to population size, there are over 300,000 people out of work who want to walk, work in the northwest. Figures of sick or disabled people who want to work in the north have soared, and there's now over 175,000 across the north, a combination of the three green bars. Almost 90,000 are inactive and are looking at after home, a combination of the blue bars, and almost 300,000 are unemployed, a combination of the purple bars. The unemployed are often put into two groups, short term and long term unemployed, and it's here where there are some regional differences. Northern England has some of the highest rates of long term unemployment in the UK. In fact, the North East, more than one in three unemployed have been so for 12 months or longer. Long term unemployed make up one in four of all unemployed in the North West and Yorkshire and the Humber. Those who are out of work longer find it harder to return to work and require more support when they uh, and rem to remain in work. However, long term unemployed individuals often see exhibit higher levels of loyalty and commitment. They may be more motivated to prove themselves and demonstrate their abilities, resulting in increased dedication to their work and organisation. Within this group, there is a diverse talent pool which can lead to fresh perspectives and a wider range of skills and experiences to bring to workforce. This slide shows the disability employment gap for each region in the UK. This is the difference in the employment rate between disabled people and the non-disabled population. Despite a narrowing of the gap in the UK, it remains wider in the northwest and the northwest of England. Again, hiring those with disabilities can positively benefit your workforce. Often their experiences in overcoming challenges and adapting to different situations can be valuable to the workplace. Northern regions make up of England make up three of the reg four regions with the lowest rate of employment among ethnic minorities. This suggests unequal access to opportunity. It's important to eradicate bias and discrimination in the recruitment process to access diverse potential. Taken together, these findings are evident that employers in Northern England need to be supported in hiring of disadvantaged groups, uh, which Jake will discuss and Jake will discuss in inclusive recruitment shortly. There are two key elements to consider when attracting diverse labour, job quality and flexible working, which I'll discuss briefly. In the LMO, we ask employ how employers plan to improve job quality. Improving job design is really important to enable those who struggle in the labour market to succeed, to succeed, and this should be clear within the job description. And offering a wide range of flexible working arrangements can also improve job quality. You're probably all aware of CIBD's Flex from First campaign. We have asked the government to mandate the right to flexible working from day one. I've added some slides on the uptake of flexible working for you to prove your new for your own time if of interest, but there's one that I'd like to talk about briefly. And as you probably guessed it, it's home working. So this is purely the number of people who work from home, and most this is plateaued at around 20%. Uh, it underestimates hybrid working by about a half. So the hybrid working is more like 40 to 50%. But I'm a sucker for maps, and I love creating this, especially as I live in one of the handful areas that's in red. So this shows the home working rates by local authority. So in London and the southeast, the hub of home working, it's visible to see main commuter routes and roads. Much of the north was a cold spot of home working pre-pandemic. And there are some areas where home working is still lower than 10%. So looking at regional figures, the North East and Yorkshire and the Humber are on the lower end of this grouping, and the North West is mid table for home working. But flexible working does not equal home working, so there are lots of other options to be explored. So here are a few slides which are looking at different types of flexible working. So we have annualised hours, flexi time, job share, on-call workers, part-time, term-time working arrangements, zero-hours contracts, and compressed and condensed hours. So thank you for listening, and I'll now pass over to my colleague Hayley.
Thank you, James. Absolutely perfect and a lot of insights there, a, a lot from our region. So really thank you for taking the time to pull those out and for talking to us today. And I know that we've had a couple of questions in the chat. Are we sharing the slides afterwards? We certainly are. Um, and my colleague Sophie, I think, has already shared the Labour Market Outlook link in the chat, if you'd like to take a little look at that as well. Um, so thank you very much for your time, James. Really appreciate it. Um, so now uh, we'll, we'll move on again. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sally Ely. Uh, for CIPD Trust. Are you there, Sally? I certainly am. Hello, nice to be Hi. with you today. I hope Hello, it's not fun. too noisy. There is no soundproofing here and next door they seem to be having some party. I have been around there a couple of times and said, please shut the door, but it's not making much difference. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear absolutely fine, Sally. Okay. So don't worry about that. You can maybe join the party afterwards, um, <laughs> depending on how the session goes. I think I've probably um, unmade a lot of friends because I've scowled so, so many times when I pop round there to be like, shh. So anyway, don't nice worry about to be with you. Listen, Sally. Lovely to be with you. Um, so for those of uh, the, the audience who don't know about the CIP Trust and, and who you are, Sally, mm -hmm. would you be able to just give us a little introduction to yourself and could you tell us a little bit about the CIPD Trust and what it does, please? Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm Sally Ely and I head up the CIPD Trust. Um, we established the trust last year, so it's very new and we're st still in our formation time, really. So bear with us. That's probably why you won't have heard of us if you haven't. Um, but we're very excited about what we could achieve. So basically, we're all about social impact, about creating social change through the power of the people profession. Um, but more simply, what we want to do is harness the brilliant skills and expertise of the people profession in order to tackle barriers to work and create more inclusive workspaces. So to James's points that he's just been talking about, there's lots of people out of work who've got barriers to getting into jobs that actually we know could really provide great solutions. It would be good for them. It would be good for the organisations. So we've got two focuses, really. One is about diversifying the people profession in itself. And we have a bursary programme and an aspiring HRD programme and other programmes in that field, really, which look at creating a more diverse profession overall. And the other side is really focused on supporting people get into work and get on within work. So sometimes it might be about supporting people who've got a job, but actually it's not commensurate with the skills and experience they have. So how can they progress? And the way that we're tackling both these issues is through deploying the skills of the profession. And it's so inspiring to talk to people professionals who can make such a difference. Mentoring is often at the core of what we're doing because it's that one-to-one -one relationship that can so often help those people with barriers. It's so much of it comes down to confidence and understanding the workplace, but also we're looking at ch changing perceptions, policy, practice. So over time, we really want to sort of change the dial in that sort of social impact space. Thank you, Sally. And I think, it, you know, you make a great point as well about the individual confidence. And I think it just takes, you know, somebody to come along, give people an opportunity, a chance and for to have a forum to talk about these types of things and try and make a positive change. Exactly. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a little bit of a context about the trust. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the programmes of work that the trust has been developing to support disadvantaged groups within the community to tackle barriers to work, please? Yeah, absolutely. So as I said, it's early days, but what we've been looking at is, as James pointed out earlier, there's lots of different groups that need support into work who aren't working, who we could do with being in the workforce. So we're like, OK, where can we start? Where do we see there being most need and areas that um, we can almost, if you like, prove our concept before moving to others? And two of the areas that we've really focused on are around supporting people with convictions into work or, as I said, into job, where those that have got jobs and trying to progress within them, um, and also supporting refugees, another group of people that we know who are, you know, outside of the workspace, but that actually really could do with being in it. And I know, I mean, I, I don't really say about stats that James on the call, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. So if we look at um, refugees, for example, um, in the UK, that they're four times higher, the unemployment rate is four times higher than the average unemployment rate and one in five refugees has to take any job rather than a job commensurate with their experience. So what we're looking for example with that group is to say well what what could we do to help that situation? Part of that 
is through mentoring and coaching and having somebody from the workplace who can help you. And that's where we think people professionals can make such a difference because you're the people who are experts at work. You're the ones who help people get into work, train, um, you know, support, develop. And so you're the best people to help others, you know, navigate the workplace, if you like. Um, if you look at, uh, so, so sorry, the programs that we're doing, we're, the mentoring forms part of that, but also on our bursary side, we've actually got some funding from City and Guilds Foundation, um, and we've matched it to provide funding for refugees who are looking to get into the people profession here. So some of that might be studying from an entry qualification, but some of it might be doing some experience assessment. So, again, it's it's supporting people who we know could add value to the workplace, as well as adding value to those individuals. If we look at and the other area of work, we're really starting to make some traction is around those people supporting people with convictions. Again, we know that I mean, I mean every year, I think it's 60 to 70,000 people leave prison every year and they go straight back. A lot of them go straight back into prison. If you get a job and in you're in a job, you're third less likely to go back into prison. So that's a really strong stat. The evidence speaks for itself. People need support, but they can also provide great workplace solutions. And going back to that point about policy and practice, sometimes it's around making that easier and understanding how we can change policies and practices now to, to make it sort of easier for everyone, really. Um, and of course, there's going to be problems. I'm not trying to say it's all easy. And that's one of the things that we're we're working through. How can we, again, deploy the skills of the profession? And it's been so uh, since I've been here, which is about a year now, I've just been so inspired in some of the conversations I've had with, you know, so many different roles within the people profession, all of whom have been really interested in thinking, actually, this is the time when I might look at this differently. And how can I get involved? And, you know, whether that's through piloting one of your programs in our workplaces, offering some mentors up, um, or perhaps looking at our practice policies again, or maybe even sharing experience of what, what we've done already. So these aren't the only groups that we're looking to support. You know, as older workers came up earlier, that's something else that we're really looking at. We know that there's um, lots of people who we need to be back in the workplace, but somehow um, for lots of different reasons, are not coming back in so how can again how can we use pe people I say use I mean harness the skills of the profession in order to make that happen and I think as the CIPD we have that um, we have that platform we have that opportunity to convene and connect people it's you that have got the skills and experience but we're able to if you like bring those you know match the pieces together Thank you, Sally. And I think, you know, you make, again, you make a really, really good point about it being a two way street. Um, so, you know, yeah. helping organisations with those recruitment gaps that they currently have. But also, you know, on the flip side, you've got um, organisations helping people from within those groups to get back into employment, too, and giving them those chances and opportunities. Um, and, and obviously, HR and people professionals have a huge, huge part to play in that. Um, and we will touch on this, won't we, at the end of, of the session, once you've finished your hot yeah. seat, Sally, about the various ways in which organisations can be involved if they are interested. So we will come to that, guys, uh, if you bear with us a couple of minutes. Um, but what I'd like to, to move on to now is, Sally, because you mentioned that you're on the start of your journey. Mm -hmm in creating and, and supporting people to create inclusive workplaces um, but that there's lots of support and collaboration from employers already who are active yeah. in this space or are keen to support the CIBT trust work already taking place in this area. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about those organisations please? Yeah absolutely can I just say the party's over now so I've either driven them away or it is done which is has made it much easier for me so even if you can hear it, it's much easier for me now. Um, Yes, people who've been shown their interest so far, we've been overwhelmed by the positive support from organisations who either want to get involved or who want to um, share what they've done. So examples like um, Starbucks, who have done lots of work in employing refugees and in the last couple of years and really changing the dial there, and they're willing to share their experiences with us. Um, Everton Football Club, I know in the north has been, very, you know, we're, we're, we've got a really good relationship with them and we're learning from them and what they've done in their charitable foundation about supporting people with barriers into work. Greg's, Timpson's, two organisations who um, are very, have done for quite some time now, 
um, had successful programs of, of actually employing people who've had uh, lived experience of the criminal justice system. Both of those we're working with in terms of learning from them, but also trying to get them to share their experiences so that people can understand how they can you know, change what they're doing. And they do it for, because it improves their bottom line as well as, their, as it's good for society. And I think that's, you touched on it just now, but for me, that's a really important point. This isn't just around about doing good because it's the right thing to do. It's doing good for other people in order to, good, to do good for your business. And that's where we come back to the whole, why should you try and create an inclusive workforce? Um, and it might take a bit more extra effort at the beginning to get it right, but when you do get it right, and Greg's and Timpson's are two organisations who have got the stats to prove this, you know, they've um, your bottom line benefit. So I know for both of them, particularly um, Greg's, that they're the stores where they employ people with convictions, well, people who've left prison are do better than the stores where they don't. So there's something really interesting in that, isn't there? You know, what is it about, you know, nurturing, supporting that inclusive um, environment that's being created when people are willing to look at things a bit differently and, and look at how, and people do need support. I think it's really important to, to make that point. It isn't, it isn't all about just doing something in a very quick and easy way. You've got to put your time in, but you know these the, the likes of these types of employers um, national grid another great example of an organization that really excel in this space and who again have offered their support to us so um yeah we're really optimistic that actually as we start this journey we've got a lot of partners that we can work with and learn from but all equally look at all the organizations out there who you know through our membership and wider who through the people profession can be putting their hands up to to actually lead this um, leave this call now. Thank you, Sally, and, and thank you for providing some examples. I know we haven't got time to go into specifics today of how those organisations are going about that and how they're supporting and um, encouraging these people back into employment um, and offering those opportunities. But uh, we can maybe revisit that. And, and I know your colleagues from your team are putting some um, information in the chat about some of the future sessions. So if people would like to, to understand more, um, they can come along to those sessions, come and talk to you and, and, and see what's going on. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and lastly then, uh, we mentioned earlier, so what, what are the different ways then? Because you've said that you've got lots of different great partnerships mm. that you've, you've forged you know, since the trust has been established. But are there ways in which some of the organisations here today could be involved in some of the prog programmes that you've mentioned? Absolutely. Or are there any other ways um, if people are interested or want to know more? Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, we'd love to hear from anyone, any individual or organisation who's interested in this space, any of the sort of areas we've touched on. I, I'm not very good at reading the chat and doing this, but I saw neurodiversity pop at some point and I thought, oh yeah, but you see, let's look at the prison population. So many, two thirds of people in prison have got neurodiversity, um, whatever the word is for it. I don't want to say issues because it's not issues, but they are neurodiverse. That in itself, understanding that, working out how we can, what, how does the workplace need to adapt and change and, and be accepting of and welcome people who are neurodiverse? Because, you know, we're going to get loads of benefit from it, but we just don't know how to do that. Um, so, yeah, put your hand up, get involved. I think hopefully one of my team has um, shared our uh, team email address. We will very soon have a website up. As I said, we are in the sort of formation stages, but really soon we'll have the CIPD Trust will have its own website. So there'll be lots of information on there. So please keep a lookout for that. If you'd like to be kept up to date with what we're doing, please do share your details and we'll make sure that we're GDPR compliant and you know not use them inappropriately. Um, we are going to hold an online session probably in July around, um, you know, more detail about the trust and its programmes and actually probably will involve some of the partners that we've talked to, some of the employers, so you can find out more if you're interested. So um, that's a bit another one of those watch this space. At the Festival of Work, if anybody is going to that in uh, Olympia, I'm afraid it's in the in the south, um, in um, in a few weeks time, um, we are going to be um, Leah and one of my colleagues who I know is on um, this meeting today. She's going to be hosting a, a session. I've got a couple of sessions. One of them that I'm doing is around is where we, I'm actually going to be interviewing Timpsons and Greggs and Offploy, an organisation that we're partnering with on one of our pilots. Um, 
to to get to support people into work from um, who've been in prison. So uh, that, that that would be a great opportunity to come and hear more from them, particularly about why they think it's important, why it makes business sense, etc. You don't obviously. I realise that I you know I know I'm passionate about it and enthusiastic, but it's those people that you really want to hear from because they're the ones who can really explain why they do it and why it makes a difference. Um, also, if you've got good practice that you know has worked for you in any of these areas, please, we'd love to hear from that from you on that. We'd love to be able to share. As I said, we've got that platform as the CIPD Trust. And, you know, so we use us for that. Make, this isn't a one way street. We want to be able to help you as well. So don't forget to, to share anything that you think might be useful for us and contact just if there's anything you want you know you've got my hopefully my emails um will be sh share my email my the team address so get in touch so it's really it's a bit of a please um if you're interested get involved any conversation you want to have we're very willing to have it so um that's my pitch really and i can see i just put the cipd trust team address in the chat Fantastic. Thank you, Sally. Um, and I think, you know, I've been trying to keep tabs as best as I can um, on all of the good practices that are coming through now on the chat. Sorry, I haven't been able to reply to everybody individually. Um, but, you know, it, it sounds like you're very, very switched on in terms of, of what you're doing. So, yeah, we would love to hear from you um, if you have any ideas or anything that you can share, uh, share out wider. Um, so, yes, please get involved. Uh, we'll also be including the details so you don't have to take them down now if you haven't got access to the chat afterwards. Um, within the communications we're going to send out afterwards of how you can get involved and, and get in touch with the team. Um, really, really appreciate your time, Sally. I know you're a busy lady. Uh, but thank you so much for kind of bringing a little bit of colour to the trust in, in, in what you do. I really appreciate thank you, it. Thank you so much for inviting me because it's really, to, in order for us to get the word out, we have to go to things like this so that we get the chance. So we really appreciate you inviting us along. And also any ideas that you might have as well, please throw them in there. Thank you. All right, thank I'll you, Sally. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Jake Young, who is a research associate at CIPD. Um, Jake's going to talk us through the CIPD research and resources that we've got in this area, as well as touching on the four stages of inclusive, inclusive recruitment for employers. Um, so over to you now, Jake. Great. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I will quickly just share my screen. I've got a few uh, slides to share. Um, there we go, that should be sharing. Yep, we've got it, Jake, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, as Kaylee said, um, thanks everybody, thanks um, you know, for giving me the chance to speak um, about some of the CIPD research that we've been doing recently on diversity and recruitment. Um, so I'm part of the research team, um, and today I'll be focusing mainly on two pieces of research that we've done, and hopefully these can complement uh, what James and Sally have touched on so far. Um, so the research that I'll be talking about is firstly our evidence-based approach uh, to assessing what works in diversity management, and then I'll move on to briefly mention our work assessing the evidence on building inclusive workplaces. Um, so one of those is, is focused more on recruitment and one of those is focused more on uh, making a difference when people are actually in the roles. So first I'll mention our diversity management that works research. Um, so with this research, we were aware that there's so much literature and discussion out there um, on different um, strategies and practices um, and techniques and tips. Um, to uh, managing a, diver a diverse workforce. And this is great, but it means it's quite hard to cut through the noise and get to actually what the best evidence is. So that's exactly what we wanted to explore. We wanted to think about the best evidence on what works if we can, or the kind of best strategies and practices that seem to give us the best chance to increase workplace diversity and inclusion. So I don't want to talk um, too in, in too much detail about the approach that we took to this, um, but just for a little bit of context, um, I want to try and give people a sense of of kind of how we approach this research. And obviously we have um, the report itself, which gives a lot more detail, but I'll just briefly go over things. 
Um, so what we wanted to do here was consult both scientific literature and professional expertise to get a much better sense of what the best evidence is on diversity management. And this graphic should give you a decent sense of the work that we undertook um, over the several months during which this um, project took place. So we basically had three workshops um, where we'd speak to um, in, uh, diversity and inclusion professionals or EDI professionals about their insights and their questions, get any feedback from them. And then between each of these, um, we would conduct desk research um, to ensure that the research that we looked at um, considered what they had said in each of these sessions. And then we'd go back um, in the next session to that group of professionals and present the findings of our literature research during each works uh, each workshop. So this this worked in a really kind of collaborative and iterative way. And what we did um, was identify six key areas that are the most relevant and important to focus on as a result of our engagement with the scientific literature and with um, those different professionals. So there's six here. They're quite large, broad areas, but I want to focus particularly on two of these um, today that are, that are most closely focused, to, uh, closely related to recruitment. Um, so those are the two final ones. So we're looking at personal organisation, fit and diversity and uh, positive action. So firstly, then we'll talk about positive organisation, fit and diversity. So decisions on selection and promotion are obviously a massive issue um, in promoting workforce diversity. So what we wanted to do was focus on how well candidates fit the job the team or the organisation and how this might influence, this might perhaps even undermine inclusive and diverse talent management. So we looked at the tension between recruiting and promoting people for fit um, and and ensuring talent, talent management practices are inclusive and how best to manage and, or balance this tension. So research tells us that um, personal organisation and person job fit are actually established predictors of performance, turnover and commitment, which is obviously really positive. Um, however, research also says that selecting um, only people who are similar to yourself um, leaves people who are maybe a different race, different gender, um, socioeconomic status, status, something like that, um, at a potential disadvantage. And here as well, it's important to consider intersectionality. So that's how different people's different identities um, interact and can complicate the notion of who fits. So what is fair to say here is that a focus on fit does have the potential to uh, legitimise discrimination. And we find that fit can occur both consciously and unconsciously through different forms of bias, um, such as affinity bias, where people um are have have um take i suppose take a liking to people who are more similar to them um or status quo bias um where people stick with those who are similar to what's come before and um, one potential solution that's um spoken about in the research is to recruit for what's called anti-fit so that's basically people who meet the requirements to perform well in the job, but may not fit with some of the aspects of the existing organisational climate or culture. And focusing, what, focusing on what the organisation needs may in fact be more useful in the long term. Thinking about what practitioners felt um, on this topic, um, generally they, they felt that an inclusive culture um, was necessary for diverse recruitment to have a long-term impact. So essentially, bringing in a more diverse cohort of employees is likely to be ineffective if they feel they don't fit within the organisational climate or culture. They felt that fit should focus narrowly on a limited set of values, and employers should challenge a focus on values that effectively covers up for non-inclusive recruitment decisions. There was also an understanding among our, uh, our practitioner group that um, of the need to appreciate and select values that don't discriminate unfairly and do reflect what the organisation actually needs. 
So, for example, um, values such as assertiveness and compassion um, may need to be tested for, for bias. And finally, practitioners did appreciate the potential um, of what's called complementary fit, which is basically um, focusing on what an, organ or an organization or what a team is missing, as opposed to um, uh, going with the same that's come uh, the same sort of people that have come before. Um, and to a lesser extent, they did appreciate um, the notion of anti-fit um, as a way of challenging and innovating the workforce. So in terms of recommendations, then, um, we recommend attempting to reduce bias in things like job specifications. So stress testing job descriptions and thinking about your own assumptions of who fits. Um, we acknowledge, however, that um, this can be quite a um, time consuming and energy sapping activity. But nev nevertheless, um, this would be a really important um, element of of adapting recruitment techniques. Um, we'd also recommend hi hiring for complementary fits, so looking at uh, the unique and complementary attributes of a candidate rather than supplementary fit, which is basically more of what a team already has. I also wanted to um, mention positive action here. So basically this is looking at um, what, what we did was look at the effectiveness of and attitudes towards two types of positive action. So the first of these is targeted recruitment campaigns or other similar activ activities such as diverse shortlists. And then the f uh, second is targeted support such as mentoring, coaching and uh, sponsorships. So what we found here was that there's a lack of strong evidence on the outcomes of positive action in the UK and which factors support its, its success. Um, there are also misconceptions about positive action where it's sometimes um, confused with positive discrimination, um, which in most national contexts is illegal. Um, then thinking about sponsorship relationships, um, these were quite a, a, a tricky one because they can potentially be quite dangerous in that they can reinforce basically a fixed mindset of talent where a, a protege is advocated for by their sponsor irrespective of their performance and what this may do is it could undermine an organization's commitment commitment to fairness and diversity so it, for example while um, sponsors for female workers have been called for this might be a case of fighting fire with fire by using the same sort of methods um, that have been used for years by male employees and which only foster inequality in the workforce. So I think it's fair to say that um, there's more research needed in this area. Um, however, what we can say is that really well designed and well managed mentoring and coaching programs can be really effective and were perceived much more positively by our um, experts than than specifically sponsorships. So what we'd say here is try and be ambitious in taking positive action on um, diversity and inclusion. So consider how any positive action strategies um, links to other organisational practices. Examine organisation and department objectives and set diversity targets jointly with people managers. Hold managers accountable for their progress towards organisational um, diversity and inclusion objectives. Guide managers on what to do if they perceive a tension between diversity and inclusion and other targets. Put adequate resources and effort into carefully positioning the aims and outcomes of any positive action. And promote mentoring while challenging exclusive sponsorship arrangements. And just quickly then, um, I wanted to quickly mention some other research that we've done, um, which is on building inclusive workplaces because it touches on what 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 I mentioned earlier. So the idea that um, an inclusive uh, workplace culture is really necessary for, di for the impact of bringing in diverse um, employees. So doing so, bringing in diverse employees is likely to be ineffective um, if the environment in which they go into is not inclusive. Um, 
So while we see more diversity in the workplace, we still lack some inclusion. Some inclusion. So, for example, we see poor pro progression prospects. We see bias, both unconscious and uh, conscious, uh, which prevent people from thriving at work, irrespective of their background, their identity or their circumstance. Um, and while inclusion is seen as the missing piece of the puzzle, what it means in practice and how it can be developed is quite complicated. So I don't have time to go into too much detail on this um, research, but what I did want to mention is just about um, what inclusion actually looks like in practice. So while inclusion is defined in a variety of ways and often not particularly explicitly, um, it can be understood from an individual and an organ organisational perspective. So at an individual level, workplace inclusion um, relates to feelings of belonging, having a voice and being valued for your unique and authentic skills and abilities. And in turn, this is then linked to positive team outcomes, um, reduced absenteeism, um, enhanced commitment to the job, suggesting that inclusive behaviour allows individuals to work together effectively and creates a healthy environment for employees. And then looking at an, at an organisational level, um, businesses have a responsibility to enable the feelings that I just mentioned. After all, they are the ones who decide who is included or excluded throughout the employee life cycle. So workplace inclusion involves fair practices and policies uh, being in place to value difference and allow all employees the opportunity to develop, participate and use their voice to make to affect change and impact change um, irrespective of their background. And in turn, this is associated with enhanced team knowledge sharing, innovation and creativity. And I should mention that while inclusion and diversity are separate concepts, it's clear that inclusion strategies can't ignore diversity. So basically, a good way of thinking about it is inclusion is the way in which organisations and leaders can create a positive environment for a diverse workforce. But we couldn't we, we should note that diversity could be substituted for difference. Um, so all employees, are, all employees are unique. So inclusion is relevant for everybody at work. And then just quickly in terms of recommendations then. Um, so we'd encourage DNI leads and people professionals to think about inclusion from an individual and organizational perspective and consider how the two influence each other make inclusion relevant to all employees, ensuring they understand it's about how we relate to others in the business. This means it affects everybody, so it's the responsibility of everybody to act inclusively. And then finally, understand that diversity and inclusion are related but separate. So in the same way that increasing diversity may not be appropriate in developing inclusion, one policy or behaviour aimed at increasing inclusion may not work for different groups. OK, um, that's all from me. I appreciate that was quite a lot to get through in the short time, so I hope that was um, useful for people. Um, and as as usual, um, these are the links which may actually be slightly dated now that we have a new website, but it's easy enough to find those two reports, diversity management that works and building inclusive workplaces. Um, on the CIPD website and you can go and have a look at the various iterations of the reports. Uh, the recommendations um, and the key takeaways, things like that. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for um, letting me no, speak, I... and I'll pass it back to Kaylee. And thank you, Jake. Um, some really, really fantastic points and some really practical takeaways, I think, and things for people to think about, which was exactly what uh, we were hoping for from this session. And I really, really liked, and one thing that stood out for me uh, was the recruiting for an anti-fit. Um, I really, really like that point. Um, and I think it's something, you know, it is, it's unconscious bias, isn't it? When you're recruiting, you're often thinking of people who are like yourself. So it's important to take those things into consideration. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you. I know you stepped in for us last minute as well, Jake, because um, Claire couldn't make it today. So really, really appreciate you stepping in and, and providing us with the research piece. Really, really great. Some no food problem. for thought there. Um, and yeah, thank you to everybody uh, for, for talking to us today.
to you. Uh, we're now just going to move on to a bit of Q&A to, to give you the opportunity to ask our speakers any questions that you may have. I know we've had a lot of questions coming through on the chat and I know that a lot of organisations have been sharing their best practice. We'll definitely have to revisit this chat, I think, afterwards to, to you know, reach out to you and talk to you um, in a little bit more detail because I'm absolutely blown away by, by what's in there. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, but a couple of questions then, and and guys, just feel free for to jump in to answer, um, you know, is 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 as and when you want to. Um, so I think we've had a question in there. Um, I'd be interested in any thoughts or ideas around neurodiversity, especially helping people transition from the support and structure in a university kind of academic environment to the differences in a workplace environment. Is there anything that anybody can maybe share to support um, that person who's who's provided that question? I know that's something uh, that um, Jill and Lutfer in my team are currently looking into. We do have some some uh, resources on the website, including uh, a podcast which talks about um, inclusive recruitment of of uh, neurodiverse individuals. But yeah, I think it's something that we're we're definitely keen to keep keep researching because it's it's becoming it's becoming bigger. Thank you, James. Would anybody like to add to that one? Sorry, it's it's Louisa. Um, in in my previous life, um, we did a lot of work around neurodiversity when uh, people were finishing higher education, um, and especially those that um, had been in it for a, a long time. Some of the structures around higher education, we actually found that um, had almost become like a an institutionalized safety net for those individuals and that structure um, was missing from our workplace, which made them initially quite difficult for them to transition into the world of work. So some of the things we started to think about was um, actually what elements of that structure were most helpful to those individuals. The one thing you need to be conscious of when you're doing this is though that um, everybody has a different kind of need. So it's not a it's not a super science one size fits all kind of model, but some of the basic principles around it, it could be that actually they uh, needed some help with structure in the day, how to prioritize task, how to um, utilize um, business language in um, the world of work. Because the other thing that we found was from education. Um, everything kind of comes from books or theories or, or um, that type of thing and therefore was very black and white and obviously as we all know there's 50 shades of grey in the workplace and that nuance is really important so actually spending time with them and helping them navigate the black and the white into the grey is probably something that I think that businesses that when we're uh, encouraging that neurodiversity of thought especially from higher education into, into the workplace for the first time. And sometimes it is first time for, for, some uh, for some of our colleagues that we're bringing in. It's probably that nuance can be quite scary and quite intimidating. Um, so, yeah, so that would be my thought. Kelly. I hope that helps. Oh, thank you, Louisa. And, and Louisa was part of the CIPT team and the employer solutions uh, team. So uh, thank you for jumping in uh, on that one as well. Um, I'd like to move on to the next question. We've had another really interesting question. And again, I'm happy for, for our speakers to jump in. Um, so this uh, this person works in a small non-for-profit where they're finding the same types of issues with niche individual job roles, less funding for more diverse job boards and struggling to convert more diverse applicants to successful hires. Do we have any advice from the speakers on that one? I'll give you a second to reflect. Because I know there's a lot to, to take in. I think I think for me, it's, yeah. I think for me, it's it's about um, it's about long term term gain rather than 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 short term gain. I think you know it's it's you know once something's implemented, you're able to you know the the job you, you've done the process of making job 
the job adverts more more inclusive and more acceptable you kind of once you get the person into the role okay it may be a bit difficult in the in the first place and the there is kind of um yeah you probably may experience more challenges at the start once the person's been in the role for a while they will kind of reap benefits for, for the workforce and you know they are more likely to kind of stay as well and I think that that's perhaps something that's potentially underlooked Thank you, James. Sally, you you, would you like to jump yeah, in? I, yeah, I was just going to add something. I was thinking this is an area where we could potentially use our convening and connecting power because it's kind of like, because it's not we don't have the answers, but there will be organisations, there will be small SMEs and third sectors who have found ways to do this well. So, you know, that's a really good takeaway for us to go away and my colleagues in the trust and think about who do we know? How can we find others that we can then, you know, share their practice so that there's, things that we can all learn from each other so I don't have the answer but I think that is something and that is you know we'll definitely take that away and think about how we could what role can we play as the trust in the in order to sort of share where examples of how it could work thank you Sally great point and I think Louisa you were nodding there yeah you were thinking yeah along the same lines uh, Jake would you like to add anything to that um I guess I'd probably echo what's been said but I, I i suppose um the the it, it kind of engaging candidates through the recruitment process um is really important and once i think it's similar to what james was saying but um once once they first firstly um before they if, if they're prospective candidates and once they actually get the job kind of removing barriers for them um like having things like um inc much more inclusive recruitment um think about things like um flexible working um removing uh, unnecessary qualifications from job adverts um providing financial support things like that and different adjustments for um candidates with different needs um both during the recruitment process and once somebody's made it into a job i think things like that are really important i don't know if that quite answered the question because i sort of lost track of the question a little bit but hopefully that helps a bit oh thank you jake really appreciate it and i, I know we've got a lot of love for that question in the chat um so if you I, i'm sorry i can't see who actually asked that question at the beginning and i know sarah's said um thank you sally all the help for SMEs appreciated please reach out to the trust team and ask them those questions and they can connect you in to people who can help you find the answers or not even the answers help you find some potential solutions and talk about it um I know Lynn I know you've put that you've got a question in there but I'm afraid we've timed out uh, we had lots of fantastic questions and we could have gone on probably for another day or so um, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Jim, Sally, Jake and the team who've supported to put on this session today I've really personally enjoyed it and I've really loved the interaction with everybody um, and a big thank you to you guys for attending today's session really really interesting uh, questions and discussion points and um, as we've mentioned we'll be sending out the resources and the materials from today's session shortly so you can continue that discussion within your organizations if you do have any questions following today's session if you'd like to reach out like you see you can contact the trust directly in the email address that's been provided we will include that in the email and um, or us at team north um, and we'll put the details in the chat our next session is going to, I know it's a long way away, guys, but it's going to be in September. It's going to be focused on health and well-being in the workplace. Uh, we'll pop the, the link in the chat there for you. It's on our Eventbrite page. Um, we're just busy building that session at the minute, but it's shaping up to be fantastic. And I'd really like to thank you all again and hope you have a great rest of week. Um, big thanks um, and have a lovely rest of day and take care, everybody. See you thank later. You. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. You. Thanks, bye. We'll do a quick debrief. I don't know if you're still on, James. I know, Sophie, I can see you're still on. And Lynn. We'll just wait until everybody drops off. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.